Uh, Amy. Oh, 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 what, what was it? Okay. Like a band, like Justin Bieber. No, 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 no. No. But let's say uh, somebody name a pop name somebody name a pop star. Or a movie star. Britney Spears, okay, Britney Spears, right? So let's say you're uh, uh call it you, you post a picture of Britney Spears. A girl you've never met. A girl who doesn't know you. And then you posted it. Well, the thing is, actually, her music kind of sucks too. Have you noticed that? You see, Brittany's just a some girl from Alabama. Who cares? Louisiana, whatever. Brittany Spears actually is that interesting in herself. What's interesting about Brittany Spears is like 200 million little teenage girls like her. And what's really interesting. Is you and her, you and your friends getting all giggly and excited about Britney Spears? She's facilitating your giggly excitement. You see, what matters is your socializing. What matters is your social dynamic. And Britney Spears is what allowing you in that in that moment to socialize. If it wasn't Britney Spears, it would be something else—a puppy or a phone. It doesn't actually matter. What matters is socializing. The object. And facilitating it. And what she notices with marketing is the best products make great social objects. Let me see your phone again. Wow. See? A panda. A pandita phone. A pandita phone. See? So anyway, since so she walked down the street, anybody's if another panda lover spots her, she's got a new big best friend. Go on Twitter. She, she has like panda people stalking her all day long. Because they love pandas. They love her. She's a panda. It's, I know, it's bizarre. The thing is, the panda doesn't matter. The panda is the social object that allows groups of people to socialize. Because we are, remember, we are apes. We are, we are primates. We are descended from gorillas. We are hyper-social creatures. We sit around and we pick fleas on each other just like monkeys. I love this. The cartoon that is. It is that all evolutions of marketing are evolutions of language. When you think about it, go back to all markets and conversations. All right, who here spent a lot of money on sneakers? Adidas, Nike. Who here spent a lot of money on who bought expensive sneakers before? Somebody? You all have cheap sneakers? I don't believe you. Okay. Can you come out here and see? Sorry. See you all. Hey, come on. Okay, uh, we told the crowd. How much do you think those sneakers cost? A hundred dollars. You can buy a lot of Yanni Cakey for a hundred dollars. You can keep doing that. Okay. When I was a kid, sneakers did not cost a hundred dollars. When I was a kid, Sneakers did not cost $100. In today's money, sneakers cost about $10. Maybe $15. Sneakers weren't interesting. Sneakers were kind of crap, actually. Sneakers were like just kind of white and kind of crap. Boring. You wore them in the gym class. Nobody cared about sneakers. But then along comes the Adidas or Nike. And you go, actually, you know, sneakers could be like really cool. We could design them really well and make them like all these kind of funky colors and like make them fashionable. Next thing you know, 
People are wearing sneakers on catwalks. Next thing you know, celebrities are wearing sneakers. All of a sudden, sneakers are interesting. What they're doing is the company that makes sneakers, Nike, or Adidas in your case, or is it Adidas? Adidas. They're talking to the market differently. Market to conversation. They're going with the conversation. Wow, maybe sneakers don't have to be crap. Maybe it'd be interesting. That changes the language of marketing of sneakers. What they did is they evolved the language of sneakers. People talk about sneakers differently than they did 20, 30 years ago. So when you're trying to market something, ask yourself, how am I speaking to the market differently? How am I talking differently? When you look at a TV commercial, most TV commercials all sound the same. It's the ones that talk differently that are interesting. The products that talk differently to your soul. Marketing language. Another bad slide. This said, your market is a collective conversation between buyers and sellers. Well, I used, to, I used to say this. Control the conversation by improving the conversation. When I was a kid, the, the, the speaker conversation kind of crap. You know, everything all the speakers were boring. Along comes Adidas, along comes Mikey. All of a sudden, they're having cool conversations about speakers. All of a sudden, they've improved the conversation about speakers. All of a sudden, they've improved the social dynamic around the conversation, and all of a sudden they make billions of dollars. Control the conversation by improving the conversation. This is my favorite. Mastery. Mastery, mastery, mastery. Anybody see this movie yet? Giro Green to Sushi. Remember this movie. Go watch it. What was, what was it like, Judy? What was it like? Did you like it? Amazing. She's a sushi chef, so she does. This is a documentary about the world's greatest sushi chef. Jiro lives in Japan. He's old. 85 years old. His restaurant has 10 seats. That's it. It's in a subway station in the middle of Tokyo. He always hears sushi. He has three Michelin stars. He's the best in the world in what he does, and he only makes sushi. And that really uh, amazed me, because when you think of like, somebody being the best in the world in the restaurant business, you think, well, he must be famous, he must have lots of restaurants in paradise in Las Vegas, in New York, and Hong Kong, and on the television all the time. No, he's like this old guy in the subway station. Isn't that right? He's the best in the world. Go to JiroDreamsAndSushi.com. Find out about the great movie. Well, you know what? I had a similar experience with that when I when I lived over in England. Oh, never mind. I worked for uh, the Salvo Road Timbers. They make the best. Uh, they make the best suits in the world. The guy, uh, he makes suits for George Clooney, he makes suits for Johnny Ives, he makes suits for, uh, who else he makes suits for? His boss used to make suits for uh, Fred Astaire and, and the Prince of Wales, make suits for royalty. These guys have small little shops, they make $5,000 suits. Nobody else in the world can make suits as well as them. And what I noticed about these guys, they were masters of what they did. And they have a kind of job satisfaction that like most executives don't have, most bankers don't have, most poor and yuppie deaf people don't have. And so as I've been working my whole life, I started thinking to myself, well, if you want to be successful, don't worry about making money, worry about attaining mastery. 
The thing is, I don't know about you, but most people aren't masters as much. Anytime I sit around, we need to be paid. But I wanted to master something. That's a guy at Google, that's a tailor, Thomas Madden. People are scared of the word mastery. Because mastery can be measured. You know. Mastery, mastery you have to be able to do something. You can't just sit around talking. You can't just sit around, you know, getting drunk and having sex. You know, you actually have to be good at something. You have to actually be better than other people. You actually have to be able to, to be confident in what you do. You can't just like, and, and you have to be able to do it. You can't just like have somebody else tell you how to do it. You have to be able to tell other people how to do it. And so, you know, I went to university myself. You're going to university now. I'm thinking, well, no, everyone taught how to pass grades, but nobody, nobody knows how to master anything. No one says master something. Nobody says, okay, I want you to be a world class mechanic. I want you to be a world class at this. They just go, well, we just want you to get an A. Well, what does A mean? But if you're a master carpenter or a master marketing person or a master salesman, then you've actually done something. I think that's pretty, uh, it's not, just not sucking, it's actually good at something. This is my, this is my, uh, this is my advice to anybody who wants to be successful, is find something you love and then excel at it. Love some, love what you do, don't just turn up. If you're not, if you don't love what you do, it's going to be really hard to compete with people who love what they do. Don't you think? You hate your job, and the next guy next in the next office loves his job. He's going to do better than you. Master something useful. I think you have to. I think you have to have, to, I think you have, to have that to master something. You, know, you can't just say, "Well, I'm really good at like sitting in the bath all day and being depressed." That's not very good. Master something useful. Here's the bad news: mastery takes ten thousand hours. It takes 10,000 hours to get a black belt in karate of practice. 10,000 hours of practice to get a black belt. That's how long it takes. Three hours a day for five or 10 years. That's how long it took me to get good at cartooning. That's how long it takes to be a really good chef. That's how good long it takes to get really, really good at your job. It's at least five years hard training. And then, called the 10,000 hour rule. That's, that's, that's the good news. The bad news is, after you've gotten good at it, it takes another 10,000 hours. Because once you learn how to master what you do, then you gotta learn how the business works. Okay, I've learned how to make suits, I've learned how to cook. Now how do I learn how to run a restaurant? That takes another five years, 10 years. So that takes another 10,000 hours. So you've only just begun. Sorry, sorry to tell you. Which is why I say work hard because the harder you work, the sooner you'll get up if you'll master something. You know, it's funny. Does anybody have any famous friends? Yeah, I do. I do. I've got a. Anybody? Uh, no two burgers. Good friend. Uh, famous cartoonist. I don't know. I got I got friends in band. I got friends in film directors. I got friends who are artists. Excuse me, ladies. Anyways, uh, so I got famous friends, famous artist friends. And what do y'all have in common? Some are film directors. Some are artists. Some are whatever. Some are musicians. They all work a lot harder than my favorite friends. In fact, I think being a successful artist means you have to have an amazing work ethic. I think live quietly is what I, what I do now. I think it's really easy to get distracted. I think it's really easy to go out and party all the time. When in fact, where are you going to uh, get your work done to your studio, your office? You know, I have a friend, he's a very famous cartoonist in America, Austin Cleon. 
and he's 27, and he's like really famous. And he's young, he's only 27. And I, I said, why are you so, and he's married, he got married when he was still in university. And he's the only one of his friends who is married. And he's uh, way more successful than his, than his other friends. And, I, and, I, and he said, well, being married really helped me be successful because I'm, I'm, I, cause after, you know, because at night, I'm at, my, uh, I'm at my, my desk working. I'm not out there at the bars chasing tail. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're out there having a lot of distractions, creating a lot of noise, well, it's just a lot of noise. Simplify. I tell people this. You know, life is bandwidth. I've only got so much time I can handle. I'm a really, really good cartoonist. But I don't spend a lot of time doing much else. I don't spend a lot of time collecting art or uh, collecting fashion or traveling or... What do people do with their time anyways? Yeah. No, that's... <laughs> because I've only got so many brain cells so many hours in the day. If I made my life really complicated, I wouldn't get very much done because I'd be spending all that time uh, chasing it. Be frugal. I started my company for like a couple hundred bucks. And because I live frugally, it means I don't have to work with somebody else, so I can live on my savings. And I think, uh, I think a lot of times young people confuse success with spending. Just because you're spending a lot of money right now doesn't mean you're always going to be spending a lot of money. And I think most successful people I know are very good at like, living simply quietly and frivolously. And the ones that aren't usually just spend a lot of time working for the man, which is a bad idea. This is a, uh, there is no secret sauce to mastery other than working hard over time and love what you do. There's no kind of special school that does going to teach you how to be a master or something. There's no special gang of friends that you shall meet one day. You'll just work it, work it, work it, work it, work it, work it, and you have any talent and stamina and discipline, you'll make it. So there's no real secrets to any of this, I'm telling you. Fall in love with your work. If you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. If you don't love what you do, the people who do love what they do will kill you. It's much easier to compete with people if you love what you do than if you don't love what you do. Never complain. It's easy to blame your boss for your lack of success. It's easy to blame your parents for your lack of success. It's easy to lay a temporary circumstance you now in. I don't like my car, I don't like my house, I don't like my wife, I don't like my job, I don't like, I don't like, I don't like, I don't like my shoe. I don't like the blue shirt. Whatever. You're complaining you're doing something wrong. When something goes wrong, you should just say, well, yeah, whatever. It won't last and move on. Don't let other people's problems get in your way. And there's nothing like, there's no easier way to let other people's lives fuck up your own life than to complain a lot. Fire your bad clients. Usually clients fire you. No, you fire them back. Bad clients will kill you. They'll eat all your energy. There's an old 20, 20, 80 rule where 20% of your your clients use up 80% of your energy. We're well, better off getting rid of the high energy users. There are people in your life right now that you don't need, so get rid of them. In five years' time, there will be people in your life you don't need, so get rid of them. Doesn't matter how picky they are or how rich. And learning how to fire people out of your life, sorry, I don't need you. Well, that takes practice. But clients can be. It's all right to fire clients. Own your own filters. Who here knows who Justin Bieber is? Yeah, me too. Oh, 
Turn your job into art. Turn your products into art. Make art. Life is short, like I said. Make it amazing. But anything worth doing will cost you your life. You think if you do all this really cool shit, that you'll end up really amazing and great? No, you'll just end up old like the rest of us and tired, because that's what happens to us all. But whatever you do is going to cost you your life, so make sure you choose wisely, because you only have one life. And it's beginning really soon once you're out of here. Be nice to people. Karma is more ruthless than you are. When you're nasty to people, well, people will be nasty to you back. The world is a really nasty place, and the only antidote to that is to be kind to people. Nice, in my experience, nice people tend to become more successful than faster, so don't be a bastard. My little secret. See, when I, when I start being a cartoonist, I didn't just want to be successful. I didn't want to just make a living. I wanted to be world class of what I did. I wanted to be, if not the best in the world, at least pretty damn good. I wanted my, my stuff, whether I was from Scotland or United States or San Domingo, I wanted the work I did to be as good as anybody as anywhere else, not just as good as the people around me in my little five mile radius. And it was that kind of longing to kind of transcend my my local boundaries, I think, which pushed me on and made me really good at that. And then of course the internet came later. And and then also it was global anyways. And I think uh, my other little secret is I still suck after like twenty years out of college. Uh, twenty years of cartoons, I still suck. The thing is, if you're really good at what you do, you're always going to think you suck. In fact, if you think you're great all the time, you probably do suck. It's a paradox. So this idea of sucking, it never goes away. You know, I'm talking to Tim Burton about this. You know, as good as he is, he still thinks he's pretty mediocre, even though he's one of the best film directors in the world. You know, it's like sucking, the feeling of sucking, the fear of sucking, is normal and should actually be uh, welcomed because if you don't think you suck, you're in trouble. So think about it. Okay, so let's talk about why you suck now. I've talked enough. I'm here for questions. Let's suck together. Thank you for listening to me. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, do we have fun? Yeah. Is that all right?